Thank you. I'm very, uh, very honored to be uh, speaking here. Um, I'd like to begin with a well-known quotation from an essay by the, uh, the Austro-British uh, art historian uh, Ernst Gombrich from his 1963 essay, it's a well-known essay, called Norm and Form, The Stylistic Categories of Art History and Their Origins in Renaissance Ideals. Reprinted a few years later in 66 as the title essay of the first volume of his collected studies in the art of the Renaissance. Uh, the first quotation reads like this. That procession of styles and periods known to every beginner, classic, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, Mannerist, Baroque, Rococo, Neoclassical and Romantic, represents only a series of masks for two categories, the classical and the non-classical. It's the uh, end of the quotation. So only two categories in art history, the classical and the non-classical. Furthermore, Gombrich pointed out, as is well known, all the non-classical terms in this list arose as derogatory terms, negative terms, or terms of exclusion, which are later acquired positive or aspiringly uh, morphological significance only in anti-classicist contexts. Their morphological meanings are thus not objectively descriptive, but always relevant, relative, sorry, to the current significance of the classical norm formulated in the Renaissance, reactivated in 17th and 18th century Europe, in Winkelmann's Germanic Hel Hellenism in particular, and surreptitiously renewed once again at the beginning of the 20th century discipline of art history in Werflin's fundamental concepts of art history of uh, 1915. There is thus, uh, as Gombrich argued, and this is my second quotation, a vital distinction among non-classical styles. There are those that are unclassical from a principle of exclusion and those which are not. Or to put it more clearly, the distinction between the anti-classical as it is exemplified in its extreme in 20th century art and the unclassical for which artists never rejected principles of which they could never have had cognizance. That's the end of the quote. Gombrich's example of the unclassical, uh, interestingly, is Chinese art. Okay. The question thus arises, from this conventional art historical standpoint at least, as to whether what in the 21st century we now call contemporary art which is broadly speaking the institutionally validated art produced since the mid-1960s, whether that art relates to the classical in one of four possible ways. These are the ways. Firstly, as to whether contemporary art is constitutively anti-classical, like its early 20th century uh, modernist precursors, Secondly, whether it is sufficiently historically distanced from the authority of the classical to have become merely unclassical, that is to say, to be indifferent to the classical. Thirdly, whether it is in fact one more classicizing reaction to the anti-classical, in this case the anti classicism of the modern, or fourthly and more fundamentally, whether something rather different and more fundamental happened in the course of the 20th century to destroy 
This Renaissance-based, classically orientated, stylistic system of art classification, replacing it with a quite different system of critical norms associated with quite different modes of exhibitionary practice. Now, it might seem strange even to be asking this question in this way at this point in history. After all, the form of historical consciousness which is displayed by Gombrecht in 1963 is actually closer to that of the beginning of the 20th century, over a hundred years ago now, than it is to the decade of its publication, that is to say the 1960s. And Gombrich did not risk positing a stylistic or periodizing concept after Romanticism. In this respect, conventional art history ends with Romanticism. Yet the question is posed, and is posed directly here, by the provocative project of Pushkin 21 to, quote, bring together the classical museum and the contemporary museum from the standpoint of human perception, unquote. So, in fact, it would seem that the contemporary is being posited here, not simply in its historical difference from the classical, a difference that is to be overcome within the present by their being brought together curatorially, but rather as the means for the reactivation of the classical itself. A classicist or a classicizing revival, that is, the third of my alternatives above, but a classicizing revival within the contemporary itself, within what one might have thought was an intensely anti-classical term. So this is a paradoxical contemporization of the classical, not oppositionally as an enlivening via its opposition to the present, but rather, it seems, through a classicization of the contemporary itself. I take this to be the Pushkin project, classicizing the, the contemporary. So on the basis of what presuppositions about the classical and the contemporary as art historical terms, is this thought of their unification through a focus on human perception possible? How sustainable are these presuppositions? And how exactly, conceptually, does this classicization of the contemporary work so these are my questions. I'm going to have three very short parts to address them. The first is called the occlusion of the modern. The second is called the contemporary and the contemporesque, or the contemporesco in Italian. I formulate this barbarous term by analogy with the Romanesque. And three, institutionality or contemporaneity a social economic form. Okay, so one, the occlusion of the modern or the, the covering over, the hiding of the modern. It's a striking feature of the dynamic immediacy of the relationship posited by Pushkin 21 between the classical and the contemporary that it occludes or hides the modern in its three main forms. Firstly, as a form of historical temporality, namely the new. Secondly, as a period within which this temporality is dominant, namely modernity, noiseide, the new time defined by the new temporality. And thirdly, as the object of collective artistic affirmation, that is to say, modernism. It is thus as if we had jumped straight from Gombrich's already belated stylistic art historical overdetermination by the classical norm 
into the present, leaping over the whole of the 20th century and a good part of the second half of the 19th century as well. That is to say, contemporary seems to function here, at least in its initial determination, as what I want to call a forgetting of the modern, or a forgetting of modernities, whether those modernities be capitalist, socialist, or otherwise. Contemporary then functions here as an essentially blank time of the present into which the classical norm can be received from outside and reactivated anew. Yet this forgetting of modernity is at the same time a forgetting of what the, both the classical and the contemporary are themselves as historical categories. For neither is intelligible outside of its relations to the modern. As a Renaissance category of both form and cultural value, the classical values the art of the ancients against the intervening barbarous others, the Gothic, by positing it as a universal style that is temporally eternal and which can therefore be brought back into the present revived at any time as an act of rebirth in opposition to the particular art of any particular day. Yet while the classical is judged in itself to be universal across time, it is only as new, that is to say, in its rebirth, in opposition to Gombrich's non-classical styles, that it emerges, at first within the Renaissance, as a living cultural historical form. That is to say, it is only through and within the proto or anticipatory modernity of the Renaissance that the classical gains its meaning as universal, as opposed to being merely historical and hence of only passing significance. That is to say, the classical is the internal other of the proto-modern. It, it is as much a part of the temporal dialectic of the modern as a perceived cultural possibility as what will become the fervently anti-classicism of the modern itself as the famous and it seems still ongoing quarrel of the ancient and the moderns reveals. The classical may be the model for the historically transcendent universality of the value of a style. Yet paradoxically, it, also, it is also the normative basis of historical classification. As Gombrich's analysis shows, historically constituted in the Renaissance in its first form, as a form of the new. That is to say, at that point, dialectically, the classical is the modern. A similar but more intensely dialectical point applies to the contemporary as a periodizing category, as the very fact of the forgetting of the modern with which, is, with which it is associated here attests for this kind of active historical forgetting is internal to the dynamic of the modern as the new, as an effect of that very process of antiquation of what is no longer new, through which the new establishes itself as new, as was shown, for example, by Nietzsche and then again in his wake by Walter Benjamin. Paradoxically, it is thus, in forgetting its own modernity, that the contemporary shows itself to be quintessentially modern. Not merely in the sense in which the classical is constituted as a part of the modern, but rather as a purer consequence of the internal temporal dialectic of the new, by which on aging, the modern must posit a new new, beyond itself, 
whilst avoiding or at least conceptually negotiating the simple paradox of a contradictory self-referentiality to which the unhappy concept of the postmodern so rapidly fell victim. In the recent history of critical discourses since the late 1990s, the contemporary has filled the vacuum created by the auto-destruction of the postmodern as a self-referential contradiction. The contemporary has thus posed the problem of how to avoid that very same self-referential contradiction itself. The contemporary, then, needs to be new relative to the modern. But as it is thus, like the postmodern, performatively part of the modern, it needs to be new in a new way. It needs to find its own specific difference within the history of the modern, sufficient to establish itself as a separate or distinctive subcategory of the modern. That is the challenge laid down by the temporal logic of the modern to the contemporary. However, before we see how a very particular concept of the contemporary meets that challenge and how it relates to the classicized contemporary of the Pushkin project, it's necessary to emphasize the absolutizing character of the temporality of the modern as the new in relation to which the temporal self-consciousness of the eternity of the classical cannot but appear as illusory. Illusory, that is, other than in the extended Baudelarian guise of a classicism of the modern as the eternalization of transience or the eternalization of transitoriness as such. For in the generalized form of its collective affirmation, that is to say, modernism, the modern is a compulsively self absolutizing normative temporality. In the famous words of the French poet Rimbaud, this is the quotation, it is necessary to be absolutely modern. That is, to be absolutely new. Indeed, in the mid-1960s, not long after Gombrich wrote Norman Form, Adorno called this demand to be absolutely new the categorical imperative of philosophy itself. It's in the context of this temporality of the new, dialectically extended into the contemporary by the aging and thereby the emptying out of the new as such, that the Pushkin po posits its dual move of contemporizing the classical through a classicization of the contemporary. So the second point, the contemporary and the contemporesque. As a result of its necessary terminological repression of its own constitutive modernity, the contemporary always comes in at least two guises. Firstly, in an ordinary theoretically unself-conscious sense of being the most recent present thing, an updating of the new to the present time of discourse. Merely, that is to say, the contemporary is the up-to-date. Let us call this notion of the contemporary of the, as the up-to-date, the contemporesque on the model of the Romanesque to indicate that this is a conceptually corrupted contemporaneity which lives on the level of surface appearance as a kind of phenomenology of presence alone. In opposition to it, we have a second concept of the contemporary. The contemporary in a more reflexive guise as a positing of the current presence specific difference from other recently but no longer new forms of the modern. It is here that the trick of Pushkin's dual contemporization of the classical and classicization of the contemporary begins to emerge, for it is only by defining the present culturally, historically, 
naturalistically scientific rather than artistic terms, that the direct connection of the contemporary to the classical can be established by a mutual universality. That is to say, the universality of scientific law mirrored by the universality of classical artistic style. These two forms of universality, posited as non-historical, come together in a Gombrichian manner, in fact, in the alleged universality of human perception, which is projected as common to each. So it's this, this is the central claim about the contemporary, really. It depends upon the universality of human perception. Us universality of the scientific laws of human perception as the embodied basis for the aesthetic appreciation of the alleged universalities of classical style. We have been here before, but we have not been here before with this specific artistic investment in the contemporaneity of the sciences of perception. A contemporaneity that feeds off their technological application in new media and virtual reality. It's this standpoint of human perception or, or universalizing concept of human perception that doubles the classical within the contemporary. Since a unification of history from the standpoint of a singularly human perception is precisely the epistemological standpoint of 18th century classicism. A decidedly anti-historical European humanism of the early colonial era. But is it really through the techno sciences of perception that the specific difference of the contemporary in contemporary art is most clearly registered? Is it not rather something more fundamentally to do with the structure of temporal experience as a new con temporality or a bringing together of different times, a conjunction of socially different times within which the classical is one, a fading multiplicity of residual temporal forms. The institutional structures of contemporary art as the art of a now globalized art world certainly suggests that this is so. It is in this institutional dimension, I want to suggest, that the true contemporaneity of the Pushkin 21 project lies. It's a newly complex institutionality of the ex exhibitionary complex, which can be inflected in variant, various different ways, politically, of course. So just my final points here on institutionality or the contemporary as a socio-economic form. If, as I have suggested elsewhere, the contemporary is fundamentally a new temporal form, bringing together in disjunctive combination a multiplicity of temporalities that are forced into relations with one another as a result of the increased social dependencies of a globalizing capitalist market, then it will be via the museums, specific forms of mediation of these temporal economic relations, that its contemporary character will lie and be displayed. Here, in other words, it is the new relations between the museum, the market, and the state that become the main mediating factors in the openness of the museum to the exploration through art of the social relations of global combination and disjunction. <laughs>
And far from being classicizing at the level of the sciences of human perception, these social relations impose a greater, not a lesser sense of their irreducibly historical character. Branding and data may be the two main homogenizing forms through which the market unifies these relations of growing interdependence. But their cultural contents in their specific differences are what makes these relations and their artistic stagings contemporary. In this respect, the contemporization of the classical would not be the techno-scientific updating of the illusion of the eternally universal. It would be a fostering of the sense of the specific historical relativities and anachronisms of the classical. That is to say, the abiding otherness of the classical. As we can see, for example, in Anne Imhoff's performance work, Faust, from the German pavilion at the Venice Biennale last year. And that's the, uh, that's the image, is, is from that performance. What is distinctive in this work, I think, whatever else one may think about it, is its staging of the gestural shells of classicism as so many compulsively invested but fundamentally alienated fragmentary forms of the classical as lost, yet still compulsively revived as lost, as part of a broken history. A broken history of which we appear in this work by Anne Imhoff as little more than bemused spectators. Thank you.